our friends and family and it's time to stop. In 2013 on Geneva's roads and roadsides, we killed or seriously injured 81 of our friends, family and members of our community, while death is permanent or serious injury results from hospital admission or some form of medical treatment. Often these injuries are severe head injuries with long-term implications, amputations, fractures, severe cuts, internal bleeding, concussion and whiplash. Because we do not tolerate doing this to each other in other areas of life, we are working together to keep our mums, dads, brothers, sisters, children, extended families, friends and people in our communities safe. Let's work together to improve our road safety. And this is not a report that's going to council tomorrow. And that's going to be the focus of tonight. We're going to be focusing on the Portobello Road, Harrington Point Road safety improvement program that's also known as the Peninsula Cycleway. But first, um, those present are going to do a presentation about the annual plan. Uh, the road um, improvement program is in the context of the annual plan. But it's my pleasure to welcome tonight um, to our meeting here, our Mayor, David Cullen. Thank you for coming down. Um, and we have Councillor Wilson here, Kate Wilson. Um, Kate is the Chair of the Infra Infrastructure Services Committee. Uh, we also have uh, Councillor Neville Peach, who is the councillor who's attached to the Otago Peninsula Community Board. And I didn't introduce myself, for those of you who don't know me. I'm Christine Gary, I'm Chair of the Otago Peninsula Community Board. And we really appreciate having our new Chief Executive with us. Welcome, Super Droz. Um, and we're very pleased to have you with us tonight. So, uh, Also with us is Councillor John Bazette at the back there. Thank you for coming along, John. Um, other staff who are present here this evening, we have um, Tony Avery, who's the General Manager of Infrastructure and Networks. Uh, we have Jean Olerenshaw, who's just behind him. Jean is the um, Group Manager of Transportation. We have Evan Matheson, um, who is the Transportation Project Engineer. Um, and we have a great deal to thank Evan for. Evan's been the one beaver the way along with his colleague Michael Harrison uh, on the funding and the design and the detail of this project. And we would like to, uh, our board has previously and would like to again acknowledge the extensive work of this team of staff on this project. We also have with us tonight Jane Neville, um, who is the corporate um, planner. And Jane's the person who's been organising the annual planning process. We have Brendan Harper with us, who's a policy analyst. And we have um, Sandy Graham, who's a corporate... I'm trying to get the title. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Manager. <laughs> and Sandy comes down, she's the staff member attached to our group. Now that's a very long list and I hope I haven't forgotten anyone. I do want to just give some apologies. Marnie Langsbury from the board, he's away at camp, so I've got just coming here. Claire Curran. A Labour MP, Phil Ballard from Broad Bay, Ian Both and Robin Dubell Smith. And so we are going to hear a presentation on the annual plan in general, and I'm going to be handing over to Mary shortly on that. But this project that we uh, affectionately, affectionately know as the Peninsula Cycleway is a very important one to this community. This project is set to deliver significant safety improvements for pedestrians, cyclists, vehicles, and our peninsula communities. It's going to connect them and it's going to produce solid benefits. While unlocking potential for new businesses, and you'll be aware of the Green Brights uh, again with that, that's really the first of the, um, the exciting new businesses that we're going to see, I'm sure. I just want to clarify a couple of things because it's an awful lot of this is a very complicated pro uh, project, and I have at times struggled to get my head around it. I've worked very hard to try and keep abreast of it and the staff have done a fabulous job at, at trying to inform me. But I just wanted to say to you that the completion of it is, I think there's agreement around the council table, that's what I read anyway, that the completion of this project, um, it will happen. I think the timing of that is very important and I think we would like to see it, um, Mayor Carl, a lot sooner than 10 years. Um, I, I guess we get a little frustrated when we see other projects creep in over the top uh, at times and we see money spent on other things, um, but, but that's just a comment in passing. So the completion, um, it's programmed for 10 years, it's not soon enough for us, we know that. 
Funding-wise, the funding is there in the of April, and those of you who are interested in the footprint um, of the widening will have put a submission to that, I'm sure. The design is basically done, but when it comes to each section, I just want to signal to you that there is an opportunity for each community to get involved in that design and input into that. And tonight, our focus is the sequence. So we're talking about which bits come first. And as a community board, the community has signaled to us really clearly that um, they want the communities of Portobello and Broad Bay done next. Because those communities want to have the benefits that McAndrew Bay has. We appreciate that the safety of all is important, cyclists included, but it's our school children that we feel passionate about. And so, we're going to be looking to hear from you. I'm delighted to tell you there's 109, is it, Jane? 109 submissions as of today on this topic. It's the highest ranking, like ranking topic. I don't know which way those submissions go. I know many of you are putting in submissions or have put submissions in. Portobello and Port Bay is due to start next year. And so it was a little alarming to find that there were other options. But we're here to talk about those tonight to find out what your views are, to hear from you, um, and to give a message to those here about what it is our communities want. Um, and so I'm going to hand over to the Mayor. I just want to um, acknowledge my board who are in the room. Um, Edna Stevenson, where are you Edna? Uh, who's from down the end, here in Quitway. Paul Pope, who's Deputy Go Chair on. of the Board, and Paul is in Portobello. Kia ora Tato, um, thank you for turning out to, to listen to us. As Christine has said, uh, I'm going to give you uh, a presentation on the whole of the annual plan and then we'll, but I'm going to skip to it pretty quickly because I want to allow enough time. This is the only meeting, I'm doing four meetings this week around the city, this is the only one where we, we focus to any great extent on the Portobello Road uh, extensions because that's that's pertinent to you, so I'm going to try and allow as much time at the end. But just as, as Christine alluded, just as um, the expenditure on the uh, path along here is part of the broader budget, so the project is part of the broader um, budget for and the annual plan for 14-15. So, let's begin. Um, we do a 10-year plan every three years and an annual plan in, in the in-between years. So the annual plan closes the loop, um, ensuring the council's performance, both financial and non-financial, is, is audited and reported back to the community. We adopted a, a financial strategy in 2012, and we just basically said in the face of what looked like extremely high projected rate increases, we're not going above five in that year, 5%, we're not going above four the one after, and we're not going above three in a year after that. And we've had two years, um, and we've stuck to those first two targets. Um, we also decided that we would get down to $200 million of core council debt by 2021-22. So this is how it worked in the, those years. Um, in 2004-2012-13, the projected rate increase was 11.9%. That was when we put our foot down and said it will not go above five. Um, and the final plan, uh, required a total of $12 million of operational savings to bring that uh, original projection down to uh, 5%. In the 2013-14 plan, the projected rate increase was 76 We took another $4 million of savings out of that year to get it down to 4%. And in the process, we also allowed for some extra million or two uh, per annum in debt reduction. This is the initial budget position for 2014-15, which is the one we're coming up to. This is the one we're talking about. Uh, the projected rate increase was 5.4%. We have said it won't be above three, and we're tracking at the moment bang on that. Um, we had to find some $3 million worth of savings. As it turns out, the staff came back to us and said, here is a budget that will give you a 2.5% increase, which Effectively, if we took it back up to 3%, uh, gave us some 600,000 to um, play around with, we could introduce some new projects, we could pay down some debt, 
or we could have done nothing and retained a 2.5% increase. As it happens, the council decided to leave it at 3% and use that extra money, spread it out pretty thin actually. Um, we provided some seed funding for some new initiatives and the remaining 179 is proposed, 279,000 is proposed to be allocated to debt repayment. But that, of course, is part of what we're consulting. So, what do we use that extra money for, what we're proposing to use it for? We've put $30,000 into um, investigation for a new Mosgill pool. The basis for that is we know that Mosgill wants a new pool, we know that Mosgill needs a new pool, and frankly, the council is not in a position to borrow the money that would be required to do it. So we've gone back to the community and said, here's some money to start some investigation, set up a trust, this is going to have to be a joint venture between the community and council, and that, that money will start off discussions about, for a start, what it is that they want to aspire to. If the community in Mosgiel felt, for instance, that they wanted all the bells and whistles and three extra pools and a swim dive pool, etc., then the sky's the limit, and if council were paying for it all, then they could just ask for it. But we know that we can't afford to buy all that, so we're asking the community to come to the party and help organise both the funding and crystallising the aspiration. Um, we've got an uh, allowance for a, a shop front library in South Dunedin. We've known for a very long time that the South Dunedin community has been in need of not so much just a library, but a community centre which includes library facilities. We're proposing to put up a very economical shop front uh, facility which will include some other services and allow other social service agencies etc to come in and co-locate and we want to try it. And um, the, there is money in long term budget, some 8 million, uh, but that's out from 2017-18. We figure for a fraction of that and some cooperation with the community, we can get something up for this afternoon community much sooner than that. Um, we put a little bit of money in. The rest of the money we're putting in is, is basically seeding um, projects and investigations that could either save the council money and the ratepayer money in the long run, or um, address issues like food resilience and energy into the future, which we know uh, and experience all around the world with various other municipalities tells us these are issues that are coming up. And the option was to just do nothing and not look at any innovative ways of looking at these things. And we decided to put a little bit of money into seed investigations into those things so that we are ahead of the, ahead of the play. Uh, what are we proposing to change? Uh, to whom wastewater treatment plant? Uh, it's a long story, but at one stage we felt that we would not get an air discharge consent from the ORC to continue incinerating the sludge. We got a 35 year uh, consent, and it was, uh, not, I think it was non notified or, or limited notification. What that meant is we didn't have to spend, we won't have to spend $10 million into the future changing the whole system. So we've taken $10 million out of our forward um, budgets and saved it, and we're using a different method. Um, uh, we'll continue with the same method, but we are going to spend some money to enhance um, how that, to, the, that plant works. Uh, contributions, uh, development contributions policy. Development contributions are the fee that we are allowed to charge developers of um, residential developments in particular for the cost of any infrastructure that has to be put in to allow for growth. So it isn't, they don't pay for just everything, we, we, but if there's a component there that allows for the growth to enable that residential development, then we expect the people who are benefiting from it to pay a development contribution, i.e. the people that are buying the sections ultimately, developers in the first place. That's what development contributions are about, and we, um, we're developing a new, um, a new uh, type policy on that. Um, We've got um, uh, funding for reuse of heritage buildings. Council voted to propose about, I think, 200,000, uh, something like that, to be spread over um, initiatives to encourage owners of heritage buildings to restore them or strengthen them. Now, 
the context for this is that we are in a very challenging environment for owners of heritage buildings. And although they're privately owned, they're publicly enjoyed. And if we took them, we all recognise that if, we, if they disappeared from our cityscape, uh, we'd be much the poorer for it. So we, had to, we can't afford to um, put millions into it. But what we found is that with a judicious application of little bits of funding here and there to owners through rates remission or a little bit of help here and there, um, we can make a huge difference and incentivise um, heritage building owners um, to, to carry on re uh, resurrecting their buildings. So th there's various ways of doing it and I'm not going to go into all the detail, but one of the ways is to say to a building owner, if you're prepared to spend the money to upgrade and strengthen up to the new earthquake standards, and that's the other challenging thing in the environment at the moment, the government's putting in a fairly drastic uh, set of requirements for earthquake proofing um, older buildings. If you're prepared to do that, we will hold your rates for the next five years, for instance, at the rate they are now. Because what happens when you upgrade a building, you increase its value, and of course, your rates go up. And what we don't want is to discourage owners who put a lot of money into upgrading their buildings and then it takes them a year or so to find tenants. We don't want to be penalising them by hammering them with high rates increases at that stage. So we just come to an agreement, we don't give them any money, we're just saying we won't take the money that we weren't getting anyway for the next three or four or five years to help you through that. Um, so that's... Um, that is the, uh, the funding for reuse of heritage buildings. Um, and here are some of the <coughs> options. Uh, you can see that we, we see the need for a, a range of options. Oh, sorry, something was right there. Um, a, a range of options for, um, for, for assisting. And you can see the, the uh, impact on rates payable for the average property. Um, $1.40, $1.40, $3.40. This, these are not huge amounts of money. This is the impact on the average rate payer of spending the $200,000 or whatever it is to um, spread across the, uh, the heritage uh, um, in the, uh, of our city. So this is just a few examples. That was the standard Canton building before um, Ted Daniels got a hold of it. Um, that's what it looks now. That's the middle one there. That's what it looks like now. He's brought it back. Um, and um, the, we provided a grant, it was the largest we've ever provided, of $60,000. He would have spent 10 times that much so far, and he's only a quarter of the way through, I would imagine. Um, but he's doing a wonderful job. This is the, uh, I'll give up slides. This is the Donald Reed building that ADA Instruments is in. Um, we made um, the following contributions to this project. This project, I think, they completely strengthened it, put um, concrete floors in as, as um, strengthening membranes uh, on two floors. It's completely refurbished. There's a high-tech um, IT uh, medical software company in there, and they're going gangbusters, recruiting uh, people from outside the city all the time, uh, because of now they've got a place to put them. Um, that project cost them millions to do, and council uh, altogether, I think, put in $8,000 for heritage from the Heritage Fund, um, $15,000 in um, warehouse precinct grants, and about $22,000 in rates relief, and that is money that we weren't getting before anyway, so it's hardly money that we've given. So for a very small, the point I'm making is that increasingly, a lot of council's initiatives are a matter of seed funding. We put in, we try and find a way of putting in a relatively small amount, but it makes a difference to the building owners. Right. The, another proposal is to, and you might have seen in the, uh, in the media, uh, a lot of controversy around uh, anomalies in charging at the Green Island landfill. Um, it's very difficult to get absolute consistency when you've got a guy who's expected to put his head out the window and figure out what you've got in your trailer and how much you should have to pay for it. So we're proposing the best way is to put a, a weigh bridge in, and there are two fees. One for green waste, that would be a lower amount per tonne, and a, and a higher rate for, for rubbish. And of course, the recycle can take off first so you don't pay for that. So that's the, um, that's the proposal at the moment. Um, it, and there's a, I'll just skip through some of these. Um, this is uh, 120 kilos, current charge is $30. The proposed charge would be 960. Um, that, so in that case, 
that um, fare glider would, would gain. That would be a lot cheaper for them. Uh, here's another one. Um, that would be a bit cheaper for them. Um, this one would be a bit more expensive. So it just, but the point, the point is the proposal is designed to make it absolutely consistent. Nobody can complain that they are being treated any differently from anyone else. But you'll be, the vehicle will be waiting on the way in. You take the stuff off, you wait on the way out, you pay the difference. Right, now I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details of this now because I'm going to come back to it um, at the end of, and we'll do an extended presentation so that people know more about it than I do. We'll do. <laughs> Um, so, but, the, but basically what we're consulting on here is the sequencing. As, as Christine said, Council is absolutely committed to this project and frankly we would like to do it as fast as we can because the context is that 60% or roughly 60% is paid for by NZTA. This is a considerable amount of money and nationwide that funding is under pressure for a number of reasons. So we want to get on to this and we don't want, we don't want to delay. What we want to consult on is the sequencing, whether, which stages we do and which order. So I will, uh, I'll come back to that and the guys will take you through that. In a, in a bit. Um, we're doing a review of the Forsyth Bar Stadium operating model. Um, it's really about the day-to-day -day running costs and revenue expectations and the associated business model. Uh, we inherited a business model which frankly um, isn't up to much and we, we need to look at it again. We can't keep going back to it and saying, oh, we'll fiddle with this and fiddle with that. We need, a, uh, the Chief Executive has said, we need a comprehensive review of how this is working. I would point out, though, that there is, you know, from time to time, some confusion around what it is we're talking about. We know that we have a debt on the stadium and we know we have to pay that back. So a good deal of the cost that is against the stadium is actually capital cost. Some nine million dollars a year goes to pay debt. Wouldn't matter if the stadium fell over tomorrow, we'd still have the debt, we'd still have to pay. The operating cost part of it is, uh, at the moment, when it's running at a loss about one and a half million on that, uh, a year that council has to find, ratepayers have to find. Um, just to put that in context, our library services every year cost the ratepayer ten million dollars a year as an operating. So it's important to distinguish between um, capital costs and operating costs. Sometime in the past, the, the ratepayers paid out however many million it was to build the library, we've paid that off now. Waipori Fund uh, Ethical Investment. This is about asking the community whether they want to have an ethical investment policy. And again, I need to make a distinction. We don't have an unethical investment policy at the moment. We have a non-ethical. We don't, it's just not taken into account. And what we're asking is, does the community want us to take into account ethical issues around investment, whereas before we've just taken into account financial ones? That's that question. Then, um, we've set ourselves financial borrowing limits. We've set ourselves a target of reducing um, our gross debt limit to 200 million by 21-22. We've accelerated the uh, our debt repayment drastically over the last few years and brought back, um, as I think I might have mentioned the last time I was here, uh, the period at one stage pushed out to 40 years for repayment of a stadium debt. We just didn't think that was acceptable. We didn't think it was fair to be lumbering so many generations forward with money when they're probably going to have to find money to, for the maintenance by that point. So we pulled it back and now the stadium debt term sits at about 18 and a half years because we've managed to pay some of it down and accelerate the thing. And I might get my chief executive to speak to this one because you, I'm sure, this is one you. Um, this, is, this is a, this graph's not actually in the annual plan. What this tries to do is show you the whole range of council's debt that's on our books, that's on your books as the people who pay the debt. And it, provides a bit of an illustration as to why we have really pulled the spending back so much in the last two or three years. What you'll see, uh, the top line, the green line, is the total. And what you'll see there is in, from about two, I mean, the, this is since the City Council came into being in 1989, 1990. And it trucked along heavily with the total of about $100 million until 1997, 1998. 
You see that leaf there, that's quite heavily explainable because we bought a Lions company. And Lions companies return a very good dividend, so they help keep your rates down a bit actually because we get a good dividend every year. And then going forward, the rates again, the debt again was pretty consistent through till about 2003, 2004, 2005, and suddenly it started to climb. The DCC debt started to climb, and the, you'll see the, the black line is the company's debt. In about 2006, that started to climb, which means that the green line, you'll see a fairly sharp escalation in debt over a fairly short period of time. The, right down the far end, the small brown line in the bottom, um, that's the stadium debt. And, and you commonly hear it said around the place that our debt, you know, the reason that so much debt is because of the stadium. But what you'll see there is the stadium only accounts for a portion of that increase. And the increase was, is there. So, Part of what we're trying to do is put out much more clearly and transparently in front of you as the people who have to pay these bills, but the people who get to use the infrastructure. So that debt climbed so quickly over a short space of time because of a range of things. The stadium is definitely one. But in addition to that, there's the Tahuna Wastewater Treatment Plant, which cost $72 million. There was the, the lengthening of the outfall of Tahuna, which cost another $30 million. There was the town hall redevelopment, which cost $45 million. There was Toy 2 Settlers Museum, which cost $36 or $38 million. There was the stadium, of course, which cost us, DCC, $160 million. And the current debt on that, as of today, is about $144 million. So there's a whole range of things here. And in addition around that, there's a few other things. There's the region theatre, and there's a number of things that have happened. So there's no doubt that we live in a city that's well endowed with social infrastructure. Um, um, and it, but, it, but it has come at a cost in terms of our debt levels. Now we're managing those debt levels and right now that finishes at the end of 2012 and 2013. Um, um, and you can see the debt has, has plateaued at the top there. At the end of this financial year, every one of those lines will have actually come down. Uh, each one a little, some slightly more than the others, but with the net effect that that green line at the top comes down, comes down noticeably. And that, that escalates over the next two or three years. And we've, we've done that really by two or three years ago with the, with the change in council, making a decision that we would not keep adding to the discretionary expenditure. And we pulled a whole lot of stuff out of the budget. And I know that can be frustrating for community boards and for outlining outlying communities. What we tried to do was make sure that every community, in a sense, uh, equitably shared, uh, shared some of the burden of that, some of the delay of what was planned to be built. And it's, we've also dealt with some of it by cutting costs in council, by trimming staff, by tightening up our levels of service, and um, I think right across the internal council departments, that's been borne fairly equitably as well. So we've tightened up in the libraries and in the museum and in roading and in water and in parks. Like everybody's borne a little bit of the cost to try and constrain things because we're pretty keen to get that um, to get that debt down. I think one of the little ironies um, looking at um, the debt levels, and I imagine that most um, councils around the country would have or well, many councils around the country, the country would have similar graphs. Only a few years ago, central government was telling councils that they had lazy balance sheets and they needed to use debt better and they needed to get some. And only a very few years later, they're telling us uh, that we have far too much of it. Despite the fact, interestingly, that central government's debt to asset ratio is a lot worse than local governments. So, um, it's, um, there's a bit political. Um, these are rate increases, and you'll see these three here are the uh, five, four, three, and then three thereafter projected, as, as I said. So I would, I would argue that's probably the first time in the last several decades when a council has said, this is what you're going to get, and you've got it three years in a row. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pleased with um, what our... What our Staff have actually managed to achieve for us when we ask them, as, uh, as Sue's outlined. Um, right. The medium-term position is that um, there are capital, um, there are still some capital expenditure projects remaining. Nonetheless, we will be still from this year on paying off more debt than we take on. 
So there's, there's a wee bit to do, um, the Tohuna Biosolids project, which I mentioned, is a little bit there, but greatly reduced expenditure, the library redevelopment, of course the Portobello, uh, Harrington, Point Road improvements, and the strategic cycle network within the city. Um, I should point out again, though, that in every case with, with regard to cycleways, etc., NZTA is taking a big part of the burden. The cycleway uh, on the other side of the harbour, the, the shared path that has to be completed from St Leonard's to Port Chalmers, is completely paid for by NZTA. Council doesn't put any money into that at all. So we're pushing them, and it's a national pool of money, so we're competing with others. So it's a, it's a bit of a game in some ways, and we're constantly just trying to enhance our position within NZTA. Um, but what I can say is that, um, and Sue mentioned uh, the fact that we've taken things out of the budget. We've taken our projected capital expenditure. It's our intention not to reduce levels of service. And um, so far, um, we, we, will, we have managed to maintain them. We're not trying to increase them, um, unless it can, that can be done with no extra cost. So we want to know, uh, that basically, the, uh, I've given you that thumbnail sketch of our, of our proposed annual plan because we want submissions to it, um, either positive or negative. Um, and the next two slides give you some information about how to find out more about um, the draft and the plan and how to make a submission. So there's an inspection copy of the plan. Um, is it here? Yeah. Oh, it's not there. Yeah. So there's an inspection copy there. Um, it's 300 pages in length. You may prefer to go on the website to look at it, it might be a bit easier, but it's available either way. And the, this is how you make a submission, online at um, www.neden.gov.nz. Um, and there's a summary of the annual plan that was delivered to you in March, and I think that most people find that uh, a little more easy to navigate than the 300 pages. And now, that is, um, I'm, I apologize if I've, I've gone a bit fast for some of you, but I wanted to allow enough time to talk about the, the issue that is pertinent to this community, which is the Portobello Harrington Point Road project. So I'm going to hand over to the guys, um, to Evan and uh, Tony. Extends from Vauxhall 
uh, through to carrying the point as one global consent so that we don't need to go back uh, each year and get a consent for the next section. Um, and so that provides for the, the widening and gives us width to then do the, the work we're looking to do. Um, and the sequence follows on after that. But if we get that consent, then the question is what sequence do we do them in? Uh, now, in the, the document, uh, this over here, it's a bit hard to see up there. What we'll try to do is to break up um, the road from uh, Vauxhall out to point in a number of sections. Those sections then give rise to options around sequencing. And what we try to do is to identify um, things like the, sorry, uh, the traffic volumes. So starting at the Dunedin end, we go from traffic volumes of around 4,500 vehicles per day. And as you expect, as you go out towards uh, Harrington Point, it drops off until it gets to be about 1,000 vehicles per day. So in terms of just sheer numbers of vehicles, um, they drop off as you go out, as you would expect. Um, the speed limit um, varies uh, along the road, obviously. Um, the number of accidents, which have also been recorded in the last uh, five years, are shown. So in the section from Blocks of the Felt, we've been 45, from the Felt, Country uh, Bay 22, drops up a little bit, Country Bay Broad Bay, a bit of a spike around Broad Bay, Broad Bay, up 27, and then tails up again um, as you go further out. Again, you can't expect that traffic volumes are a little bit lighter. Um, and um, obviously, uh, our viewers around the Port of Ballard area, um, probably a bit of a change in terms of traffic behaviour, in terms of numbers of tourists, uh, numbers of cyclists, and people that live in those areas. Because you've got built up urban areas, obviously, in Port of Ballard, and in Broad Bay, and Country Bay, and Mac Bay, less of people out this way. Uh, and of course, at that point, there you can come up uh, Highcliffe Road. So a lot of tourists coming down Highcliffe Road, coming back in, vice versa, also not going down. So it's a bit of a change there. Uh, uh, numbers of schools, uh, one at Trinity and Country Bay, two at Port Bay to Portobello. Uh, so we cut off those estimated cost for the each of the sections and the length is given there as well. It's trying to give some indication of um, the safety issues, but also the issues generated originally or identified originally by the community board as to their priorities, which was, um, and I'm sure Chris will correct me wrong, but centred around in many respects where the schools were and trying to get kids safely um, from homes to schools in the all urban areas. So that's just by way of a very brief uh, sort of coverage of that. Uh, oops, let me do that. Sorry. <coughs> um, right, so um, again, it's a bit easy to see if we've got the uh, brochure. Um, but the current plan in terms of sequencing is as shown here. Um, there's a couple of things to note. Um, the next section, and this is, assumes that the consent is granted for the entire length from um, Boxall out to Barrington Point. So the next section is OCAP issues at Harrington Point. This is uh, the section here shown in E1. Um, that's always been the next priority in the community board priorities. That's a program to do uh, this year. Um, it may still into well, from July of this year onwards. Um, all the options have this as the next um, bit to be done. Um, we've gone to NZTA and the Transport Agency done the Transport Agency's other confirmed funding for that. If we try and change that sequence now, we get into all sorts of difficulties. We won't get to in those sequences. So all the options have uh, this as the next bit to be done. Um, and from Port of what we're looking at is a three metre wide sheet path. It might be a bit narrow in some places along here, out from Port all the way out. Um, back from Box of Africa, we're looking at a three metre uh, cycle path, two way, and a three metre wide foot path. Uh, right along, which would mean that we have to change the markings at the King Bay Link if that's the new proposal. Um, the other thing to note, um, which is some of all the options except the last one, is what we call D2, uh, which is um, this little here, which is uh, from Weir Road, we have to go beyond Port Valley, the road's already been widened, from Weir Road to Harlow. Um, what we're looking to do is brought that forward because uh, for those that have walked along that road, you may notice that the seawall is not in great shape. Um, it's in risk of uh, failure. So what we've done is try to bring that, what we call the Harlow turn off, 
forward in terms of the original sequence and fund that out what we call our renewables and budget. So we take it from a different pot of money to pay for that. So that takes it out of the capital cost of this. Uh, we think we can do that because the wall is falling down. And if we're going to replace the wall, uh, we won't do it unless we move the wall out three metres and make the path all the way through. So assuming we do that, uh, from Portobello through to Harwood, we we'll then have a three metre <coughs> or the path. Uh, and then we probably would need to remark a bit from Portobello out to Rio Road to repeat that. Some of, the, some of the design ideas have changed since the original one. Uh, of course, from Harwood through to back here, it's already been widened previously. Uh, so those are the only two. Uh, that's pretty common to all. Uh, this one is common to all of the options. Uh, the sequence then has um, a broad bay, very broad bay, this bit here, right through to Portobello, done uh, next after that, and that would be in the 15, 16, 17 year. Uh, and then it would start from Vauxhall uh, out to Glen Phillips, and do this bit in here. Uh, and then it would be Company Bay around by supporting to Broad Bay. And the last bit would be the Soda Cow Golf Course bit, which is the inland uh, bit of the, the road. And we've, we've put it, we've decided, that one we've put at the end and, and all the options because, in terms of highest priority, obviously you don't have to see on your side. Um, the vehicle numbers are lower out there, so we'll move that more towards the end. Okay, so that's the current, so it's a slightly revised um, plan that was originally. Um, identified for those the two main reasons. One is we think we'll be the set of renewals, and this bit here, given the other priorities along here, we've we'll moved that further out. Okay? That's the current plan. Uh, option uh, A, uh, the main difference in this one, um, it's a subtle difference, uh, the main difference is what the sequence is pretty much the same, so we still do this E1, and we still do the Portobello to Harrow Hull Journal. Uh, but this one here, there's a little section in here which is between Broad Bay and Portobello, it's a bit around the point, um, which would be delayed um, until further on, so it comes out at C5, which would bring forward the start at Vauxhall by a year. <coughs> so the focus on that one would be doing the um, <coughs> sections around uh, Portobello and Broad Bay, uh, to reflect the, the build up urban areas, um, not do the bit in between, uh, and then bring forward from Vauxhall um, a year earlier as a result, and then build um, all the way out. So that's option A. Uh, option B um, is, I suppose, a more radical option. This one changes the order uh, and the start. Sorry. So option B, this one here is a, uh, this one here changes the order. So we'll do the end bit. Again, we've got to do that end bit first, otherwise we lose the funding. So we'll still do the Harvard turn-off bit, but in this sequence it starts from the, the city of Vauxhall and slowly builds its way out, joining up um, in sequence as you come out. So this option has it, sorry, from Vauxhall uh, out to Portobello. So obviously a change in terms of the viewer. Uh, and the last option, which is option C, uh, it's a subtle change this one. Uh, and the only difference in this is that this uh, bit that's a uh, bit that would be the renewal um, would be left to the end. So we patch the, the, the wall, patch up the sea wall, keep it going, but we wouldn't renew the whole lot until further down. So uh, that would bring forward uh, the sequence by a year or two for the entire lot. Okay. Um, so what the um, what you've got in front of you is a number of options. Uh, the council asked us to, cons to consult on all of the options and get feedback for that. Um, what you've got is submission forms are looking for, as I said, you've know, got 109 submissions on this so far. Um, and it's hopefully, understand, it's a little bit complex in terms of the options, but hopefully it's a bit clearer now. Uh, so we're looking for your feedback. Can I start with questions? Or are we going to get questions today? Uh, yeah. Right, I'm going to start with questions. I'll just ask for clarification because there's a lot of information 